Hey everyone, I'm Neil Oxterby from UCI in London, and I'm here to tell you about a pilot study for uh, what I believe is a very important application of computational models of aging in age-related diseases, and this is for helping clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. Broadly, loosely, I call this my quest for supermodels and drugs. So it's a sole author submission, this one, but there's a team behind us. Um, this is the UCL PONS team and more broadly the EuroPONS initiative that you just heard about. Alzheimer's is a challenging disease. There's a lot of variability, there's a lot of factors involved, and it's quite heterogeneous. Um, and clinical trials of the last couple of decades, mostly with anti-amyloid therapies, have not been reaching their endpoints due to a potential bunch of reasons down here. Recently, Biogen and ASIS trials involving aducanumab were eventually submitted to the FDA for regulatory approval, and they've been given priority review as of July. So this is potentially an outlier uh, in terms of those two decades of failed trials that I mentioned. And we'll see what happens. So what's, why have they been failing for so long? Um, basically, there's a few different potential reasons. The ones I want to focus on today um, is that the in levels of individual variability are too high. So we need to recruit the right people. Um, so a more homogeneous group than we've been doing so far. Um, maybe we're recruiting them too late. So maybe into the symptomatic phase is too late and the damage is done. So we need to recruit people at the right time in the disease, for disease progression. And we may be looking at insensitive endpoints as well. We should be using biomarkers instead of cognitive measures. So individual variability can include things like age of onset, um, anywhere from your 40s through to your 80s or 90s if you live that long. And the rates of progression also vary quite a lot from individual to individual. To overcome this heterogeneity and find the right people at the right time, what we need is precision inclusion criteria for the clinical trial. Um, and we need to be able to characterize, characterize the earlier stages so that we can move to these earlier and earlier trials. So the tools that we require to overcome this uh, multifactorial heterogeneous disease is that um, we need commensurate tools that can handle that. Quantitative assessments in the asymptomatic phase. Um, sounds simple. Precision biomarker-based disease signatures. Um, we also may well not uh, understand the mechanisms too well, such as the amyloid hypothesis, but that's not something I'll be addressing today. So what are trials done so far? Basic screening includes risk factors like age, obviously, um, and for Alzheimer's disease, uh, APOE4 is a genetic risk factor, various other things, cognitive testing. They've been using um, structural MRI to rule people out, in exclusion criteria, and more advanced uh, imaging and biomarker measures for screening in so people at risk with amyloid and tau pathology. Um, so here's on the top row, a uh, normal participant, at the bottom row, an abnormal participant across three imaging modalities, amyloid tau and FDG. So these imaging modalities allow us to look quite precisely, um, reasonably precisely at how severe these different pathologies are in an individual. And these have been used for screening in for some of the latest clinical trials. So the imaging has actually been added as secondary endpoints as well, but um, amyloid and volumetric imaging is the primary modality used for currently screening in, in to a clinical trial uh, and more recently the well not that recent anymore the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative ADNI was set up to uh, basically see what value imaging could add to to this kind of thing, clinical trials clinical studies in Alzheimer's it's become the global benchmark with a large quite a large data set um, and it's influenced protocols for clinical trials around the world and has a couple of thousand papers um, using the data one of the things that inspired was a hypothetical model of Alzheimer's disease progression from left to right, going from the cognitively normal phase through a crude prodromal phase of mild cognitive impairment into dementia, as being a sequence of things that become abnormal on the vertical axis. Um, there's a couple of different versions of, the, of this hypothetical model of disease progression. It's a single model for, for all patients. Um, it's an assumption based on anecdotal evidence, observational experience. So disease progression modeling was inspired by this hypothetical model. Um, where the main aim is to develop quantitative signatures of how the disease plays out over time uh, using biomarkers, uh, anything you can measure that um, correlates with disease severity at some point. Uh, and the utility of this, having this quantitative signature, this computational model, is some more precision, higher precision staging, um, and can help with earlier, more accurate diagnosis and prognosis. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. For example, uh, you could do a differential diagnosis, diagnosis application where you have, again, biomarker severity, um, vertical axis and disease progression left to right. Two diseases, disease one on the left, disease two on the right. And you bring along your new individual who has one time point for each of these four different colored markers. 
line them up with the disease and stage them. So you can see that this individual is most likely a late stage disease two case. So traditional models for this um, basically rely on knowing the disease stage um, and doing some sort of a regression. Um, we actually have an unknown disease stage time. So traditional models really only could do something very basic, like for example, stratifying groups of patients based on their cognitive score. And in this case, a cognitive score called the mini mental state exam. And you can get crude group differences. So even on imaging marker, we can see this uh, heat map of abnormality in pre-symptomatic, mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is a group level atrophy and stratified by a, a very crude cognitive test score. It's a crude idea of disease progression. Um, the most interesting, in my mind, computational models of Alzheimer's disease are generative models. Um, and the main one I'll look at today in, includes unstructured data. So we just have scalar biomarkers, some numbers that you can measure like on a blood test or other. Um, uh, so continuous models include things like trying to estimate biomarker trajectories from data, and this is ADNI data in this particular example. And there are a few papers down there for you to look at, and differential equation models that try to estimate the long-term trajectory from just a short-term um, sample. There are also discrete models, such as the event-based model, and this is the one I'm going to focus on for today in my pilot study. Um, which give you a sequence of events um, and the uncertainty in that sequence. So the sequence is top to bottom here and uncertainty is left to right. A uh, very dark black diagonal would be a uh, high certainty in the ordering where the more uncertain areas, um, high positional variance, uh, indicate that as far as the data can tell and the model can tell, uh, there's a bit of uncertainty in that ordering. And more recently, this has been advanced into a clustering model as well, clustering on top of a disease progression model to automatically discover subtypes of disease progression in the sustain model. But I'll be focusing on the event-based model and how it can help in clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. So the long game for computational models for trials is to individualize them to get the most precise staging and stratification you can for screening people in. So the first step is to take the models that we've already built um, and take part to a pilot study of post hoc analyses of some completed clinical trials data. Tell you a bit more about the model first so that you understand how it works, and then I'll, I'll jump into the results from analyzing the clinical trial. So, the event based model, uh, Fontaine et al. from the NeuroImage paper um, eight years ago now, estimates the order of, of events, disease events, from just a cross sectional or a short term longitudinal data set. Uh, it's data driven, requires no prior knowledge of disease stage and in fact kind of relies on having multiple disease stages so patients at multiple uh, stages of disease combinations of severity across features um, in order to estimate what that sequence is so the original model was on familial disease and then it was generalized later um, by the ucl pond group to handle sporadic diseases and various other limitations how does the model work? Well, again, if you have this cartoon of the disease progressing from left to right, the biomarker severity on the vertical axis, uh, you have a red marker comes first and a blue marker becomes abnormal second. What you see on the bottom here is a visualization of individual slices vertically for individual cases, uh, where a yellow measurement of biomarker one means it's normal, uh, same as biomarker two, yellow is normal, green is abnormal, so it's this event measure here. Um, and it's the people in the middle that give the combinations of having one uh, normal marker and one abnormal marker. So normal on blue, nice and low here, and abnormal on the red, nice and high here. And that, that tells you that the red marker is most likely to come first. So when you've got someone early in the disease, they've got two yellows, someone in the middle, a yellow and a green, and some at the end, both green abnormal markers. And the cool thing is you don't need to know where they are in the disease progression. It's just those combinations of normal and abnormal that tell you um, the ordering. The cool thing about this, once you've got the model, you can stage individuals, you take their data, you line it up, same as in my cartoon earlier, and here we've got different cognitive um, classifications in the ADNI data set, uh, lining up to this model and the counts of individuals who are staged early, late in this numerical disease progression stage. And you can see that most of the Alzheimer's cases are uh, to the right, more extreme, and most of the controls to the left with the mild cognitive impairment being spread out. Um, and this data-driven model basically correlated with what we think happens in Alzheimer's disease in terms of the sequence of events. Um, but now we have this extra quantitative staging tool that we can use to understand the disease and to individualize perhaps uh, our screening criteria. And the continuous models all have a similar one where you've got um, cognitively normal in blue through to 
full blown Alzheimer's disease in red being staged at this latent time that the model estimates. So there are models, other models available. So let's talk about application then for this particular study in the so-called MCI trial, which was a trial of two treatment arms against placebo, um, uh, quite a high dose of vitamin E and a high dose of denepazil, which is a symptomatic treatment for Alzheimer's. Works to improve your symptoms for a couple of years, but then after that, you're just the same as if you hadn't had the drug at all. And this trial was reported in 2005 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Data comes from the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study. They have a number of studies that you can access data for clinical trials in Alzheimer's. So the recipe then is to build the model. And I'm going to use ADNI data to build the model. So separate data from the trial. Uh, stage the trial data at baseline or screening using the baseline screening data there. Stratify individuals based on early, late, so to find the right people at the right time, and then analyze these subgroups to find out what that right time was, which was the right group, um, if any. So this is how the model looked. In this particular trial, there was no imaging. So this is just a bunch of cognitive instruments uh, ranging from clinical dementia rating scores through the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, cognitive subscale, um, various other ver versions of fluency and memory tests. When you stage the ADNI data, and again, uh, Cognitive normals here are blue, Alzheimer's are yellow. Uh, you can see that all the normals staged pre-abnormality and stage zero. All the Alzheimer's in yellow-orange are staged towards the end and MCI are staged in a somewhat heterogeneous manner across the disease progression. So instead of staging the ADNI data itself, it staged the trial data from the MCI trial. All of them were MCI participants um, by the definition actually. And you can see that when we stage them, you get three quite clear uh, clusters, no, early, moderate, and late. So if we stratify by those computational model stages, um, and then we can analyze those subgroups. And this is the, uh, my version of table one from the, the, the paper um, for the MCI trial, showing group differences, placebo minus treatment in a cognitive test score that increases as your cognition uh, worsens. So if the idea being placebo should increase more than treatment if the treatment has an effect. So you will get a positive number in this table. You get worse scores in placebo, higher scores than in the treatment arms. Um, we've got both the treatment arms, denepazil and vitamin E in all of these three, each of these three clusters. And I've highlighted the two statistically significant results um, in terms of a t-test of differences, two sample t-test of differences that uh, reach the significance of 0.05, uh, 12 months and 36 months, there was about four and about six points uh, improvement in the denepazil arm for the individuals who were later, so who had uh, slightly more cognitive abnormality than the other subgroups. So this is in principle, this pilot study has shown that you can use computational models of age-related diseases to stratify uh, in a more precise manner and to use this potentially for screening in into a, a clinical trial. What's next? Make the models better. Individualized prediction for precision staging and stratification again on right recruits at the right time. Um, I hope to find some trials that I can access the data for, which is a challenge uh, with imaging as well, and see what the added value of the model is, of the uh, added value of the imaging is, and then we can come up with the best combination of running the trial in the most efficient manner. Uh, translate this into a drug development tool in, includes running it prospectively uh, with a, a hypothesis to start with. Um, which will be a, a key step in uh, re getting regulatory approval for something like this using computational models to uh, aid clinical trials. Now, future work also on the side is going to look at disease mechanisms. Um, if we have better models of disease mechanisms, we may be able to understand that perhaps, um, let's say, uh, amyloid only therapies are just going to be inadequate. Um, and uh, something I'm also interested in is looking at what we can do with uh, new versions of data acquisition and new models that we can run. So, you know, deep learning, more pure sort of machine learning ideas and some novel biomarkers. Thanks very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.